Uh, good morning. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, nice to see you all uh, in our panel on writing on the Holocaust. Uh, we will start with three presentations and then at the end of the panel, we will probably have a few minutes for, for discussion. Um, um, it's my great pleasure, my great privilege to uh, first introduce, maybe I will go uh, up before each of your presentations, I will introduce you all. So uh, first I would love to introduce uh, Oscar Knoblau. Oscar <laughs> does not need introduction, obviously here in the room. He's an exceptional man, an exceptional man who has spent the last 25 years teaching many, many students all across Greater Phoenix about the Holocaust, how to survive it, and what we should remember about it and how we should live with that knowledge. In recognition of Oscar's work as an activist, educator, and philanthropist, the Arizona Jewish Historical Society honor him very deservedly with a Jerry Lefkowitz Heritage Award in 2020. He published his important memoir, A Boy's Story, A Man's Memory Surviving the Holocaust, 1933-1945. He's currently an active public speaker and a board member of a Phoenix Holocaust Survivors Association. Welcome very warmly, Oscar Noblau. <laughs> thank you, thank you very much for the introduction and good morning. It's a beautiful day out there. I enjoy each and every day. I don't know about you, when I wake up in the morning, I'm glad to be alive. And when I look out the window, to me, every leaf, every flower, every bird is life. It's precious. And I feel very privileged to be on this earth and share it with other people. This is how I share my beauty, which I see every day. And I hope you do too. And that brings me closer to believe and see who I am really am. What am I made of? Why I am here? on this earth, you have to find yourself. I encourage the students to do the same. Get to know yourself. Ask yourself, who are you? Do you really know who you are? What do you want out of life? And if you do find it, go for it. And it's the same as writing a book. It's a commitment, life is a commitment. You cannot just sit down and say, okay, I'm gonna write a book. Book about what? You have to have a subject matter. It's the same as growing up as a person. What do you wanna do with your life? So in my case, yes, I came to Canada in 1948. I came to a country I could not speak to anyone because I didn't know the language. The people who sponsored me, fortunately, they talked to me in Yiddish. So they were the only people I was able to communicate. Now they were responsible for my family, for my mom, my brother and myself to take care of us, to give us housing, food, shelter, and uh, hopefully, we will not be a burden to the Canadian government, which we weren't. So when you arrive in a new country, what is your priority? Learn the language. That's a must. And they told me. I knew what it was all about because this was not my first time that I had to learn a new language in my life. When I was 11 years old, we had to leave Germany where I was born. 
where I went to school, where I had my friends. We had to leave because my parents were Polish citizens. And so we left Germany and we came to Poland. We settled in a city called Krakow or Krakow. Beautiful city. It is so beautiful that when the Nazis came and waged war against Poland, they did not destroy anything in that city because they didn't want to destroy it. They wanted it this way for the next thousand years because it's going to be theirs. Arriving there, obviously my parents said, you need to learn Polish. Within a few days or weeks, I find myself in school only to come home crying because I was bullied. They didn't like me. I was a German. I was a foreigner. I could not, I could not talk to them. I could not converse with them. I tried to explain to them that I am no different than they are, that I can do in sports the same as they do, that I play soccer. They, they didn't want to hear this. So they hired a tutor. And within eight months, eight months, I was speaking fluently. I mean, according to the teacher, she always made a remark that in that short time, even though that I'm a foreigner, I speak better Polish than they who were born right there. So that was the priority. And the same priority was in Canada. Learn the language, find a job. Okay, 1940, 48, 49, a job. Work eight hours a day and they provided a job for me. I worked in a company called Tip Top Tailors, which was a, they were making clothes, men clothing. Uh, they were sewing clothing for the army, for the Canadian army. So I'm working eight hours and I'm making $18 a week. That's take home pay, $18. That's right. There used to be wages where a man would earn $18 a week. It was an education for me in many ways. One, that yes, if you want to do something or have something and buy something, you have to earn it. You have to work to get paid. I also learned something else. Canada was not the freest country to all people. The very person who became my boss, my, my, my boss, in other words, I had to report to him to work. We had our workshops in the basement. He was black. He was a Canadian, a retired teacher because he was stuttering. And I have learned from him exactly how the blacks are being treated in a country like Canada. That was a learning point. But the part was that you always want to better yourself. So you're looking for a better job. And I also found out that I could have had a wonderful job and this doctor even told me that I can start the following week. He read my resume and he said, everything is fine. I'll make sure that you will finish college. You're gonna to go to college. You're gonna read all those books here on my wall. And someday, because they, he didn't have any children, he'll take, off, take over my practice. Now his practice was in a medical building, one of the tallest buildings at the time in Toronto, called the Ford, like in cars, medical building. I was jubilant. And I told the people who sponsored me, and she had a long face and she said, you need to go back and tell them that you are a Jew. I said, well, maybe he knows that I'm a Jew. I mean, he read my resume. No, you have to officially put down on the application that you're Jewish. And I did. Why? Because no Jew, 
can practice or work in that medical building, the Ford Medical Building. So they, here I am learning real fast. So again, there is no time. There's so many things on my mind. So the Holocaust became, put it on the back burner. My wife, nice Jewish girl, I married because again, all the time lost during the Holocaust, I have to make up now. So I see this girl coming along and she's beautiful. I'm gonna marry her regardless of what. And the next thing you have a child. So again, everything is the back burner. She was American. She didn't want to continuously go and re have her visa restamped every three months or whatever. So she decided that we're gonna move and we moved to the United States in 1953 to St. Augustine, Florida. Oh boy. Long story, forget about this, but time goes on. And pretty soon I get more interested in the past and only to find out that they don't say anything. They don't teach anything in schools at all. You open up a, a, a history page and there's one page about the Holocaust, one page of a Holocaust with, which was in, in fact, eight years long. Because when I count all the years I was under the Nazi thumb, it's exactly eight out of 12 years. I was under their rule, my family and I, eight years. Multiply this by days and hours and seconds and minutes. So when my kids were high school age and I would tell them stories, they always said, you need to write. You have to put something on page. You have to put it on, on papers. I had never written anything. And by the way, because I was so busy going to school and so busy being a husband and having kids that I didn't go back to school. So how do you sit down and write a book? But finally, because of the fact that nothing is being taught, I decided to do ahead, go ahead and write something. So my first publication in the year 2000 was this. Journal from the Dark Side, a little skinny book. When you go, go through it, you'll see there's no chapters. <laughs> there, uh, there's this page after page. A friend of mine read this, and she, uh, she is not Jewish. And she said to me, I know about literature. She says, you have an account here, which you need to elaborate. You are writing only quick things. It's like you give people a taste. Let's write about it. Get into the story. You need to write a whole, a regular new book. So I started. It took me three years. Now, when I started, it was what, 19? It was 2017, uh, no, 27, 2007. I didn't have a computer. I had a typewriter who barely typed. And of course, my English was atrocious. I mistakes just like crazy. So the next thing my son says, I, my wife and I, we have a little word processor that was a, a next to the typewriter something more fancy it was electric and it had a little screen a tiny little screen but it was correcting words so talk about obstacles i started physically writing the book with a pencil and paper yeah I went outside in the backyard and sat under the little place we have there. And I stared at a 
plain page, empty page for hours. You know how agonizing that is? The very first page is the most important page and the most difficult page to write. How many times did I have to tear it out and throw it out? No, I didn't like that. I didn't like this. I finally decided, okay, maybe if I record something, I used to take long walks. That didn't work. Back to writing. Then I couldn't even reread re my own quickly writing. Because you see, when you finally get into, when you put your mind back where you were so many years ago, and you see this happening right in front of you, you want to write it so fast. And by doing so, you get sloppy. So yes, there were a lot of things in my way until finally my granddaughter had, has, outgrown, has outgrown her first Apple computer. They gave it to me. Hallelujah. A printer. I don't have to worry if I make a mistake because that thing, that brain is correcting everything for me. So that's done. Okay, the book is done. Not yet. Do you know what I had to go through with this? Just to put it in this situation it is. I knocked at every printing shop. Nope, we don't make books. We don't put them together. Besides, what do you have? And I have loose papers, a stack of them, printed. So this one finally guy says, well, may I look and see what this is? And he sat down and he's reading. I said, could I leave it with you here? He says, I have not another appointment. And I actually left it with him. He called me the next day and says, I want you to come over. He actually read this whole thing. He says, I didn't go to sleep. I needed to find out what happened. And so he says, I can print all this, have it ready for someone to make it a book, but I cannot put it together. You have to find someone. Again, I'm pounding the sidewalks, one shop after the other. Oh yeah, we, how many copies do you want? How many thousands do you want? I said, I want a hundred copies. No, we don't do that. Finally, I find this one guy. He did it for nothing, for nothing. There it is. So I had to do this. Now, when this was done, what to do next? It has to be published. But before you can publish it, you have to have it edited. Well, my granddaughter, a graduate of this beautiful college here, and uh, she got herself a job at uh, Chase, Man Chase Manhattan uh, Bank. And while having lunch with her co-worker co there, talked about the grandfather, me, and, and the pages. And he's like to make a book. And he says, well, look no further. My wife is an editor. Holly North. She read and she says, I want my name on that book, period. This was her second book she ever edited. And she did a marvelous job. And she was one who told me when it was done, what are you going to do next? I said, well, I'm going to take it to a publisher. He says, no, you don't. I said, what do you mean? You have to self-publish it. And I did. There's a lot of hurdles. You got, you got to apply for copyright. You have to have this, this guy up here. There's a, a whole bunch of stuff. But my son, he said, that's no problem, Dad. I can do all this for you. And he did. And they did the website for me. He, did, he came up and he actually designed a beautiful little thing for the book to give to the teachers. Two of them, as a matter of fact, it was the first one. Then he went away and said, okay, now you got the book. Now you need to talk to schools. He came out with a beautiful letter. And he says, 
sent them out, and I mailed them. And lo and behold, there were so many answers. My granddaughter had to go on the computer and find Schedulista for me to schedule all the, all the different appointments because I couldn't, keep, I couldn't keep track. The book is self-published. I was fortunate enough to find a printer right here in town. Of course, that took a lot of phone calls, a lot of places to go, uh, many discouragement, but he has been printing this book for all the years since 2010. And I thank Holly because you see, if you publish the book yourself, you own the book for the rest of your life. I can between, this is the third edition. I have changed it. I narrowed it down. I had it re-edited. It is now very professionally done. You wouldn't think or know that is self-published. I have edit pages. I've removed pages. And uh, I was recently told that I need to remove one or two paragraphs because the book now has been picked up by three wonderful ladies and is in is a curriculum called the hope chest and there is a line in there which is not offensive it is what shall i say it's not curse is nothing has nothing to do with curse words and it was brought up to in Scottsdale to the board and the lady who runs the board, especially as far as sanctioning any words or sentences or books, she said to me, she says, nothing. She says, the book stays the way it is. If we start taking out one word or one, two or two sentences, we will continue doing this. So it stays the way it is. She says, do not change anything. And we didn't change anything. And it is being taught. It's being used right now as we speak in schools. If you want to write a book, think hard. What is your subject matter? If you finally decide on something, I didn't have any research to make, to do. The only research I did maybe on dates and places, just to verify, because remember, that during the war, up to the year 1943, 43, 1943, we were completely isolated from any kind of news. But from 43, after the liquidation of the ghetto, after I finally got the job for the, working for the Pumoska Gestapo, I was listening to a radio every night to the BBC and finally found out what's going on in the world. So I wanted to make sure that the dates are right. But yes, you have to do some research whenever you work. If you publish it yourself, right. So there is some work involved. So thank you very much. Appreciate it. Good luck. Uh, and th this is fascinating, Oscar. Thank you so much. And I hope that we'll have a chance to come back to, to you uh, after Mila and uh, Ade Adina. Uh, I don't know if I said it correctly. <laughs> uh, our second speaker is uh, Mila uh, Getzle Getzlevich Raz. Uh, she's a past president of a Phoenix Holocaust Survivors Association. Uh, she's a member, um, she's, a, she's a board member and education chair. She's a retired speech pathologist. But for us, most importantly, she's the author. She's the author of a popular Help Me Talk Right books and contributing author in other publications. Uh, Mrs. Ra's newest publication, The Birds Saying Eulogies, a memoir, is a recounting, uh, is a story of the harrowing experiences of her parents during the Second World War as they struggled to survive. So she's our second generation speaker, and then we'll have third generation speaker. 
Uh, the book, The Birds and Eulogies, a memoir, was selected by the Greater Phoenix Digital Library for its curated collection of the best writing from Arizona authors, Just Read Local Author Collection. So I'm very happy to, to welcome you here and let's give a warm welcome. Thank you, Anna, for that introduction and thank you all for coming this morning. I'm sure you have a lot of things to do and I appreciate your being here. Uh, I am the child of two Holocaust survivors. My father was from Łódź, Poland, and my mom from Lvov, which is now Lviv in the Ukraine. Uh, I have known all my life that I am a child of survivors uh, and uh, so there was no moment in time where, boy, you know, suddenly I um, realized what my parents had been through. Part of the reason is, is that my parents, uh, when they would get together with their friends who were primarily other survivors, they would talk about their Holocaust experiences. And if I was very quiet and I didn't interrupt them, I could listen and understand and hear what they were saying. The reason I could understand them is because I was born five weeks after my parents arrived in the United States in 1950. They didn't know English, and so they spoke Yiddish or Polish at home. And that's how I learned um, those two languages. My um, father used to say to me, he's, when I would talk to him, he would say to me, you know, it would take a Tolstoy to write what I went through. Well, I'm not a Tolstoy. I don't come close to a Tolstoy, but I did um, write the book, The Bird Sang Eulogies, a Memoir. I got the title from my mom's poetry. My mom was a very quiet woman. She expressed her emotions uh, in her poetry, which in the book, I have put all of her poetry about the Holocaust in the book. And my father, uh, who was a very verbal, very social person who would talk to anybody about the war, it was much easier to talk to him. In uh, the mid-90s, I decided that I must videotape my parents and get their testimonies. Why? Because I felt that if they don't say their stories, and I don't get the stories, they will be forever lost. And that was my argument with them when I asked them to allow me to videotape them. It took me about four years to convince them. And I finally went out. I mean, obstinance is very helpful when you come uh, to talking to survivors and also when you want to write a book, which I didn't know at the time I was going to do. I also were um, in. Uh, um, and videotaped my, well, no, actually, I, yes, I videotaped my uncle, my father's brother, and my aunt, his wife, uh, as well as my father-in-law. Each of them, the my father and his brother and my uncle's wife were all from Woods, and um, my father-in-law was from Kovno, Lithuania. Uh, so they are all taped. And my father was also interviewed by the Shoah, US, um, USC Shoah Foundation. And if you Google his name, you can hear him talk. At any rate, uh, when I retired, I decided, well, you know, mm, let me see what I, I really need to uh, take my parents' testimony and put it to paper because I feel that future generations will be more apt to read what I write, in my family that is, read what I write, then go to the video. And so then, thus began my uh, transcriptions of what they had told me. Uh, also at that time, I was uh, going through my daughter's uh, stuff under the bed and I, uh, decluttering so to speak, and I came across uh, something she had written for her senior thesis at U of A. And it happened to be a story about my father and his experiences during the war. So I took it and uh, I started to read it. And I said, oh, this is very interesting. I'll incorporate my daughter's uh, writing into what I write uh, 
for this, uh, for future generations. And then I began my writing process. It isn't easy uh, to write about the Holocaust, to read about the Holocaust, to watch a movie about the Holocaust, and to write about the Holocaust, for me, is extremely tortuous. And uh, so my rules were I couldn't, I, I would write maybe two hours at a stretch, but I couldn't write more than that because I could feel my heartbeat starting to increase and I'm starting to get more agitated. So then I would stop. I couldn't, I can't do any Holocaust related anything after about four, four in the afternoon. So, and if I'm going to see a Holocaust related movie, it has to be no later than two. So these were the, uh, the uh, guidelines that I used. Um, and I learned as I was writing that I had to stick to them. So uh, I began my writing process and then I um, lost my train of thought here. I began the writing process and then I, uh, somewhere in there, my husband said, oh, guess what? Uh, they are having a, um, a photographic exhibit in Boston. There was a man named Henrik Ross. And Henrik Ross was in the same ghetto that my father was in, the Woods Ghetto. The Woods Ghetto was in, my father was in the Woods Ghetto from 1940, the spring of 1940, until it was liquidated on August, in late August, uh, the completion uh, of the ghetto, uh, it was completed in 44. So my father was in that ghetto for many, many years. And this man, Henrik Ross, he was a photographer prior to being put in the ghetto. And when he was then put in the ghetto, the Germans gave him a camera only to take photographs of propaganda pictures that the Germans wanted to put out. At any rate, the, uh, he didn't think he would survive. So when the ghetto was liquidated, he put the, all his film in canisters and buried them, hoping that one day someone would find them. Well, he survived along with his wife, Stefania, and they unearthed the photographs. The photographs were then, uh, the, the, it was a process, but in 2017, uh, the, all of the pictures were then available and the universe and Boston, the um, Boston Art Gallery had them on display for a few weeks. And so I went, we had to go back east anyhow. So I went to Boston and um, Volker, can I, can I put that picture up or should? Oh, there it is. And I'm walking, thank you. <laughs> and I'm walking around looking at the little pictures uh, that, they, that were there because they were pictures of workshops. And I knew what workshop my father was in. So I'm looking carefully and I'm getting disappointed, but it's reasonable for me to, to believe that it's going to be impossible for me to find a picture of my father. There were not that huge number, uh, numbers of uh, photographs. And then, so I'm looking and at everything, and then I come to a dead stop in front of this picture. And I looked at it and I said, oh my God, that's my father. And I called over my husband and my cousin who came with us. And I said, I, that's, that's my father. And we're all looking at it and trying to, you know, how can we be sure the only available information that it was taken on a transport out of the ghetto somewhere between 1940 and 1944? Well, so began my process of figuring out how to let people know, first of all, to ident make sh get 100% uh, uh, identification of it, but then also how to let the owners of the um, photographs know about it. So I did go through the process and the photographs are at the Art Gallery of Ontario. And I contacted the curator, Maya Sutnik, and she told me, and we went through, I sent her pictures. The only pictures I have of my parents are post-war. This is the earliest photograph I've have of either one of my parents. And so we it was back and forth emailing. And finally, she it is now identified as Daniel Getzlevich. My father was actually born as um, Gedalia Getzlevich. Uh, but there were some changes, you know, Americanized, so, so on and so forth. 
at any rate, when I found that picture, that was like, you know, I'm going to have to use it as the cover, which obviously I did. The, um, the, um, my research, because I had done the taping of my parents and I knew their stories, I didn't have to do much research. The research part came when I recalled and I wrote in the book that my father, when my parents came to this country, their reception by the American Jewish community was abysmal. And my father tended to be quite a critical person. So I felt, well, I really need to do some research here and make sure that it's just not my father and my parents' experiences. So that's where my research began. And lo and behold, it substantiated what my father had told me. So that is the, in a nutshell, the how, how I came to uh, write this book and the research involved with it. Then now the question is, how does one go about then taking what you put on paper and making it into a book? Oscar told you um, some of the what needs to be done. Well, I started publishing, self-publishing in 1992. Why? Because at that point I had written my first Help Me Talk, Write Book, How to Teach a Child to Say the S Sound in 15 Easy Lessons. Well, timing is everything. Because when I wrote that book, then who, can, who comes into the picture? Amazon. Okay. And Amazon changed the whole face of publication, of the publishing industry. And my book was such a niche book that I really had to self-publish it. And because I had to self-publish it, I had to learn how to self-publish. So that was an entire process. And I did use a book at the time. There was someone who can't come out with a book, how to self-publish. And he gave detail after detail of what to do. I won't repeat what Oscar said because he told you, you know, the copyright and Library of Congress, so on and so forth. So that's what I, um, that's when I began. And the hardest part of publishing anything is marketing it and that getting it to the people that is extremely difficult. So if one is going to publish a book, one has to seriously consider how you get your readership to know, to informed about this book. And today it is so much easier than it used to be, so much. There are so many people who self-published, even the biggest name authors self-published. And in addition to that, unlike when I published my first books and I had to go to a printer and so on and so forth, uh -uh, didn't do it with this book. I decided now you can go onto Amazon. They have a template. You can go put everything on the template and then this, I mean, you do have to have various things in place, but you put it on the template and it's published. The beauty of it is that you don't, you can go in and make corrections at any time. Yes, you do need um, to have it edited. You do need that. But publishing is now simplified, amazingly simplified. So I encourage you, and one more point, why did I not go to a publishing house? First of all, I know the industry now, and I know that no matter who is going to publish my book, I'm going to have to do all the tough stuff. So that's why I did not go to a publishing house. And now, thank you all. And <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, and the third generation, uh, last but not least, um, our last speaker, Adina Ostrowski. I don't know if I am I saying it, yeah. <laughs> Adina Ostrowski is a deputy county attorney who has dedicated her career to helping the most vulnerable in our society. She did this by prosecuting child sexual abuse cases and domestic violence cases in the Maricopa County Attorney Office. Currently, she works with federal agencies to extradite fugitives from countries abroad. She's the vice president of the Phoenix Holocaust Association and a founding member of uh, from third generation uh, in Arizona. 
most importantly for us, she's the grandchild of two Holocaust survivors. And she wrote uh, about, um, to honor her grandmother's life, she wrote her story, Living Among the Dead. And I welcome Adina uh, Astrowski. Thank you. If it's okay, I'm going to stand. Um, I'm just more comfortable this way. And I work as a prosecutor. We're always standing. And um, I have a few slides, so I figured I could just go through them. Um, so thank you so much. Um, like everyone has said, um, it's really an honor to be here today um, to speak with you all about publishing um, and to share um, you know, the stage, so to speak, with Merla and Oscar is really an honor for me. Um, so I did publish my book, Living Among the Dead. And unlike Merla and Oscar, my book was published through a publisher. So it was a slightly different process than what they went through. Um, Amsterdam publishers published it in, on March 3rd of 2020, right before the pandemic. So that was not so great. Um, but I did find myself at the US Holocaust Museum with, for a sort of book launch, book signing event right before COVID. Um, but the book has done um, exceptionally well. I'm just really um, humbled by that in the awards it's won and so forth. Um, and so in kind of sticking with the theme of today's um, talk, you know, why, why did I do this? And it's very similar to um, what, you know, primarily what you heard from Merla. Um, you know, it's a really a matter of preserving my grandmother's story, preserving her memories. That's a picture of me sitting in my grandmother's lap. Um, I, I grew up with my grandmother. We lived in Montreal in the same building. And, you know, when I was young, um, before my sisters came along, my mom would take me to my grandmother's apartment and I would spend hours with her daily when my dad would come home from work so my parents could spend some time together. Um, I grew up very, very close with her. My Hebrew names, Rivka and Nahama, are named after, I'm named after her two sisters that were murdered in the Holocaust, Rivka and Nahamka. And there was something about that shared namesake that even as a little girl, I can remember laying in bed and having that sort of connection with her. Um, and so anyways, um, you know, fast forwarding a lot of years, that's my grandmother with my three children. And um, um, similar to what Merla was saying a bit, um, my grandmother, and actually what Oscar was saying, my grandmother had to learn six different languages as a refugee in order to assimilate and be one of the community members. And um, she really did um, look to writing as a medium of, of a way of really dealing with the trauma and the isolation and so forth. And um, when my children were very, um, well, not very, very young, but when they started to become teenagers, I started to think, gosh, I really need to make sure that I have all of her writings, whether they be in Yiddish or Polish or English, all together in one, you know, in one area. And so I can make photocopies of them and take it to Kinko's or Alpha Graphics and get it bound because I need to make sure that we, we keep this. It's most of it was in her own handwriting. And so um, I started to do that. And then, then it occurred to me, I probably need to explain some of these writings. Like she, she writes about her garden, which I'll go to in just a second here. Um, you know, what, what, what is so important about the garden? Why was that instrumental in her, in her memories and what, when she thinks back to her hometown in Poland. And so um, even though my family was from Montreal, they, we moved here to Arizona in the early 80s, in the late seventies. And we moved my grandmother here and um, similar to me spending time with her and making sugar cookies and drawings. She did all this with my grand, with my children. I started to interview her and I would bring my kids with me oftentimes because it kind of kept her focused right on what I wanted to know. But um, the difficulty um, that hasn't been discussed already with writing a book, especially this type of book, is if you've ever worked with trauma victims, it's very hard to ask them questions and have them recount what's happened. I've done this in my profession. I've put countless young children, adults, victims of all types of you know, horrible abuse on the witness stand. And it's very, very difficult to say, tell me what happened to you. Um, and similarly, it's no different when speaking to a Holocaust survivor. You're bringing that person back to that moment of terror and they're having to recount it. And of course, I knew my grandmother would then suffer for one or two weeks, sleepless nights. So I didn't want to just ask a quick question. I wanted to make sure I was sitting down with my laptop. Thankfully, unlike Oscar, I had a more updated laptop that could make corrections easily and so forth. And um 
you know, and, and really get her story and draw it out and, and get more information. Um, also, I will say um, there were many times that I would ask a question. Again, a trained prosecutor, 18 years, I thought I was asked was not a good question. My grandmother would look at me like I was crazy, but I've since learned, you know, a simple question really doesn't always deserve a simple answer. These are complex situations, complex stories. And she wanted to make sure, and she told me this, I want to make sure you understand everything. You have a complete history of what happened. So um, I brought my kids with me when I could. It kind of helped her to stay a little bit more focused. And so we, I started to fill in the gaps between these beautiful pieces of poetry and writings that my grandmother, my grandmother wrote. And just to give you a, a very quick example, in March of 2000, she wrote Our Magic Garden. And this, this is just the first two sentences. There once was a magic garden through my childish eyes, most ideal where the early spring's warm sun on my face, I still can feel, you know, just very, very touching. And I wanted to understand these emotions that she was feeling. And so in 2017, after about a year, a year and a half of writing, I self-published just like Merlin Oscar did. And for the same reasons that they described to you, I self-published this book. It was titled Mother of Souls, S-O-U-L-S. Um, there's a picture of sunflowers on the cover because my grandmother always talked about these huge fields of sunflowers. Where she was from in Poland is now part of Ukraine. I actually visited this exact hometown last summer and I saw these fields of sunflowers. Um, and the book did fine. I mean, I didn't really keep a close eye on it. This isn't, you know, I wanted to really do this for my children. And then I found myself at a writer's conference. I was with my son who, who likes to write science fiction. It's a lot more of an, you know, fun, fun, fun area, fun genre. And um, I was speaking with somebody who happened to read my book and they really talked to me about this sort of wider reach that you get when you go through a publisher. They do some of that, um, the, the media, the marketing, all of this. And so I looked into publishers. I just went on to Google and I looked up publishers that are focused on this genre. And I got a list of maybe five or six internationally that looked interesting to me. And then I started to vet them. And the number one publisher on my list was Amsterdam Publishers. And so I reached out to them and I spoke with the owner, Elizabeth Hink, who, um, who did read my book, my original Mother of Souls book. And she came back and said, listen, I'm, I, I think her exact words were something like, I have fallen in love with your grandmother, um, but your book needs to have more of a historical context. I want to know what happened to her, but I want to know things in the broader view as well. And you're a third generation. We don't have books about third generation survivors. How does this affect you? And so you need to go back and you need to do a rewrite. And so I went back and I spent another six months to a year on top of my full-time job and raising my kids and all of that. Um, but working with a publisher, she had the editors. I saw on Google Docs, which I don't know if any of you are in that. It's I, I hate Google Docs because it scares me. I'm going to delete something and never have it back. But I could see on the column in, in different colored fonts based on who the editor was, discussion. So my grandmother, for example, used some word to describe a latke or a pancake. And there's a whole discussion about whether that word was used in that town because they, she wanted to make sure everything was historically accurate. So um, so anyways, so that is, um, that's what I did. And I ended up publishing the book, like as I mentioned in the very beginning with Amsterdam Publishers, um, with regards to the cover of the book, I love that Mar that Merla brought this up after my grandmother passed away, which was actually one month after the self-published book came out. Um, I was going through her her albums that my mother inherited, and um, I found this picture, and it just spoke to me in ways I don't know enough words in the English language to actually describe. But I love, love, love this photo. That little girl is my mom who's sitting right here in the audience. And that's obviously my grandmother. And this is taken in Berlin. My mom was about three years old, according to my grandmother's handwriting. And so as soon as I found this photo, I sent it to my publisher and said, this is the cover. It, it has to be something like this. Um, that's just a picture of me and my grandmother. I, I was going to talk a little bit about being a third generation, but for the sake of time, I'm going to skip that. Um, and just quickly about my book, a little bit of wrap up. Um, 
One thing about being published through the publisher, um, I did keep all the rights to my book. So every publisher is different just because you go, you traditionally publish um, doesn't mean you give up the rights. I have been, um, I, that was part of my contract was that I would keep the rights to my book. In January of this year, January 3rd, the educator's guide, which is on the right, um, that got, that came out, that was published. My book's been now picked up in, my book has now been picked up in um, several school districts. It's been placed on the curriculum of many schools, not just in Arizona, across the country. Um, I actually worked with an educator of about 30 years. Um, Kim Klett knows her and Kim was instrumental um, in creating the educator's guide. And so I've been very, very fortunate that that happened, um, that that has recently happened. Um, and I, th I think that's everything I was hoping to cover and that hopefully there's enough time for questions. Thank you so much for this free, fascinating, very, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. Uh, I, uh, I don't know, we are past time. Do we have a few minutes, five minutes uh, for at least a couple of questions? Anyone? Uh, yes. Uh, um, I hope, is it okay if it's not specifically about writing? Like, yeah, yeah. okay. Um, I guess primarily for Oscar, but I think probably for everyone time willing. Um, what does Yiddish mean to you um, or not mean? What, if any, you know, hopes do you have for it? Well, right now, It just means that it is kind of a language. It never was an official, quote, language. Um, you learn this on the run, so to speak. If not for World War II, I don't think I never would have spoken it. Today, I don't speak it. I hardly can understand it. It's, I wouldn't say, I personally don't consider myself that it's a big loss that I don't speak Yiddish. But a lot of my friends are angry with me. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, also say a few words. Yeah. Well, my I have a different view on Yiddish. Uh, there is there's a big revival of Yiddish, and yes, it was an official language of the Jewish people. It has a written form. It it's a combination of Hebrew and German. It's uh, if you want a dialect, but in and of itself, it is a language. Uh, I am I feel I would really have loved to have be, become a fluent Yiddish speaker. I understand it and. I think if I were immersed, I could manage to speak it, but uh, it's a beautiful and expressive language. Thank you. One more question, we have time. Ah, that's my chance. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I'm particularly interested in generational history. So maybe uh, Mila and then Dina, can you talk a little bit about, okay, what is it like to take on the persona of your mother or respectively grandmother, right? Um, you are one or two generations removed, and yet that, that story is being passed on to you with, with consequences for your lives. When I would speak to my grandmother and have her tell me what you know happened so I could document it, she would tell me, and I think she said this in her interview with the Shoah Foundation, um, it, telling my story was not my pleasure, but I felt it was my duty. And that is 100% how I feel. Um, I never turn down a request to speak, whether it be about my book or my grandmother or hate crimes or anti summit whatever. I always will say yes. I feel like it is a duty that I have. And I'm not saying anyone placed it on me. It's one that I have inherited myself. Um, but I do feel it's very important to keep these um, detailed stories alive um, and I am afraid that with each generation, we're losing more and more of that. Um, so it's it's something that I, um, I I make it a priority in my life. I am named after my dad's mom. So that's how I um, have Merla. And uh, I always wanted to know, I would always ask my parents, who do I look like? What did 
your mom look like? What did your sisters look like? And how about your brothers? It was always this need to have a connection. And in 1990, I once again, I nagged my parents to go back with me to Poland, to go to with me to Poland. And they did. And that was so special to me because have, going with them and seeing where my dad lived and where my family was from, uh, we did not get to go to uh, Lviv. It, it was Lviv then, and it was in Ukraine. It was much more complicated because of the Soviet Union fell apart. And it, it was just a very complicated uh, thing to do then. So I didn't do it. But I, as a, I do feel uh, as Merla, you know, uh, that this strong, strong connection Thank you. Thank you so much to, to Oscar and to Mirla and Adina for this wonderful, wonderful uh, 